This is Focus on Africa. I'm Lucrasa Burak, our top stories. Justice for Nathaniel. The police shooting of a South African teenager with Down syndrome whilst out shopping for biscuits reignites the heated debate about police brutality in the country. After months of protests and a coup which ousted the president, talks resumed to forge the road ahead in Mali. We'll bring you the very latest. Also in the programme, Afros, anger and apologies in South Africa. Hair brand Tresemme and the pharmaceutical company Clix face accusations of racial prejudice over an advert describing black hair as dry, damaged and frizzy and white hair as fine, flat and normal. And in sports, the International Olympic Committee says the Games in Tokyo next year will go ahead regardless of the coronavirus pandemic. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa, coming to you from BBC World News. Well, we're starting our programme and the week with the ongoing developments in Mali, where talks have been continuing to try and find a resolution to the country's future leadership since the coup that led to the ousting of President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita last month. Well, this weekend, Mr Keita actually left the country seeking medical treatment in the United Arab Emirates. So let's get more on this. I'm joined now by our West Africa correspondent, Mayani Jones. Mayani, lovely to see you back on the programme. Big welcome back. Um, so lots has uh, been taking place over this weekend. First off, though, President Keita has gone to the UAE. What can you tell us about this? Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, so he left on Saturday evening. We were told that he headed to the United Arab Emirates after suffering a minor stroke. It's unclear what kind of treatment he will be getting there, um, but his spokesperson had told the media he would be back within 15 days. OK, now, lots of talk or rather talks have been taking place, even more talks. Let's start off first with what took place this weekend. They have been described as chaotic, lots of people taking part. Was everybody around that table, including the Tuaregs? Yes, yeah, so a number of stakeholders took part in the weekend conversation. Uh, the main opposition junta uh, was there. A number of the military leaders have taken over um, and they came to speak with representatives of uh, the regional bloc, ECOWAS, uh, to discuss uh, the timetable moving forward. As your viewers will remember, ECOWAS has asked for elections to take place within the next 12 months so there can be a transition from military rule uh, to a civilian government. Um, the junta have asked for President Kuwait to return to the country uh, within uh, three months. They say that if he doesn't return within that time, um, they will not be meeting those requirements. So a number of them have come around the table. They say President Kuwait needs to be back within three months. Uh, it's unclear at the stage when he plans to return, if at all. OK, and another meeting that was taking place, not in Mali this time, but Mali certainly on the agenda, was one in Niger, and this was chaired by ECOWAS. Yeah, so that's happened today. Um, ECOWAS hasn't actually met, hasn't had uh, its head of state meeting in person for over six months now uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this was uh, quite unusual. A number of heads of state showed up, including the Nigerian president, Mohamedou Buhari, but also the president of Ghana and of Senegal, amongst many others. Uh, they discussed the Mali. Uh, they reiterated uh, their previous statements, which said that uh, the country should return to civilian rule uh, as early as possible possible and definitely no longer than uh, within 12 months. But they talked about other things as well. President Buhari was keen to remind uh, his cohorts in the rest of West Africa that they should stick to their term times. Uh, many see this as referring to the recent decision by Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara to run for a third term, a decision which has caused protests in the Ivory Coast because many of his critics say that it's unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of the lines obviously that came out of this meeting today was that uh, the ECOWAS are calling for a transitional president and, and prime minister to be named by September the 15th. There are lots of demands, aren't there, on both sides. How are things going to be resolved? How likely is it that people will start listening to each other? What's the feeling? 
I mean, the problem at the moment, one of the main problems is that different factions within Mali are not agreeing and not speaking to each other. It's, it's unclear who exactly is in charge, if it's popular movement, if it's the military heads of state, um, the military uh, heads of the country at the moment. So it's very difficult to know who exactly ECOWAS should be talking to. It's very difficult to know how the situation is going to resolve itself. And with President Keita now out of the country, um, many people are looking to see whether Mali, which has been unstable, as you know, because of uh, the security situation, many jihadists um, uh, planning numerous attacks within the country, carrying out numerous attacks within the country. Uh, many people are worried that Mali could become even more unstable than it's been in recent years, and it's causing a lot of concern in the region. Okay, Marnie Jones, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Let's turn our attention to South Africa and the death of 16-year-old Nathaniel Julies, who had Down syndrome. Well, his death has sent shockwaves across the country. The teenager was shot by police officers on the 26th of August in El Dorado Park, which is a suburb just south of Johannesburg. But police brutality is not a new problem for the country. It's been reported that more than one person dies every day at the hands of the South African police force. The BBC's Pumza Fidlani has been following the story. Anger spills onto the streets of Eldorado Park. One of their own has been killed. The teenager who had Down syndrome had gone to buy biscuits when he was shot. This is where Nathaniel Julius was shot, just a few meters from his home. His death is the latest in a series of high-profile cases that have shocked South Africans since the coronavirus lockdown. The cops went in looking for other suspects, though, and when they came out, that's when they found Nathaniel sitting by the truck. They just called him over. As he walked over, the guy just shot him, and when they shot him, he fell under the truck. A life wouldn't be the same without him. You know, for someone that couldn't speak, that can walk into a room and just change the atmosphere of that room, his warmth, he can walk into any house here in Nilboro Flats, they won't chase him out. They will let him sit and eat. He was a house child wherever he went. Three police officers have been arrested and two of them have been charged with premeditated murder. If found guilty, they stand to spend life in prison. Count number one is that of murder. Count number Not two. only are they accused of murdering him, but also a cover-up. It's claimed the officers tampered with the evidence and the crime scene. It's still early days in this court case. It could take years for a ruling to come in. But those investigating the police say they're determined to see that justice is served. The outcry over Nathaniel's death has highlighted a deeply fractured relationship between law enforcement officers and the people. It should stop in South Africa. It, this is just totally unacceptable. We can't continue to have police officers who are behaving like this, killing people randomly. and. We, we, we're just not going to accept people who are going, police officers who are trigger happy at the same time. So we need to, to deal with them. So we're busy making examples with those officers as such. I believe now is the time for us to stand together as a community and just rally behind the family and stand with them and really show that this is now the time that we can make change. Police brutality is not easy to stop. But Nathaniel's family, especially his mother, are clinging to the hope that his death will not be in vain. Pum Zafitlani, BBC News, Johannesburg. You're watching BBC uh, Focus on Africa. Let's just take a look at some other stories now making the headlines across the continent and the rest of the world. Sudan has declared a three-month state of emergency after a series of floods killed 99 people. The Sudanese Minister of Labour and Social Development said the floods had affected more than half a million people and damaged more than 100,000 homes. It's thought that much of the flooding was caused by heavy seasonal rains, mainly in neighbouring Ethiopia, which then caused the Nile River to rise. Two Nigerian men have been arrested for allegedly scamming a German state that was trying to buy over two and a half million US dollars worth of personal protective equipment. 
Police say the suspects cloned the website of a Dutch company to obtain an order from the German state of Rhine, North Rhine, Westphalia. Uganda's Labour Minister Mwesigwa Rukutana is facing several charges, including attempted murder. It's alleged he shot at his opponent's supporters after losing the primary elections. Police say that one person was seriously injured. He's denied the accusations. Well, do stay with us here on Focus on Africa, because still to come, Peter's got the sport and... They're calling it the games that conquered COVID. Organizers say the Tokyo Olympics will go ahead. Welcome back. A leading retail pharmacy in South Africa has got itself somewhat tied in knots, so to speak, after its hair advert was called out for being racist. Clix Pharmacy, which has more than 500 stores across the country, describe black people's hair as dry, dull, damaged. And white people's hair, well, that's fine. It's flat and it's normal. Well, the company removed the advert that was actually commissioned by Theresa May and went on to issue an apology. But the anger continues and has once again reignited that sensitive subject of black hair. Well, in protest, people have taken to the streets and, of course, the ever popular social media. Well, there is one South African writer known as uh, Lesa Gutlabi, but online she's also Coconut uh, Kells. And she's hit back in her very own unique way using the power of satire. Take a look. So it's moving. It's moving. It's not stiff. It's not nappy. It's moving in the wind. In the wind. Do you understand? Okay, one more time, please. And. Okay, and, uh, oh my god, this is so dull. This is why they call it damaged. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Um, and cut. No, this is why they call it damaged, guys. It's not Clix's fault. Um, <laughs> I've shown you side by side what it could look like, and <laughs> you've seen for yourself. It's so dull. Um, it's damaged, it's lifeless, it's nappy, um, but it's also greasy at the same time. Well, do you know what? I'm so glad because the woman behind uh, that wig and the video is uh, Lesego Klaubi. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, it brought a smile to many people's faces, but the message behind this, well, we hope it's getting through, but you've used satire, very powerful medium. What were you trying to say? Well, I was just actually kind of going in the brains of the people behind the decision-making. Um, because for me, I mean, I've worked sort of in advertising and done collaborations before, so I do know that it takes quite a few people from concept to, to putting an ad out there. So for me, it was just kind of like trying to see into the minds of people who clearly made very racist um, decisions and, and, and showing how silly racism is. Because to me, racism is damaging, it's violent, but it's also really ridiculous, the things that people think. So yeah, it was just kind of like going in the minds of, of the creatives behind such an ad. And how is it, though, uh, Lesegu, that for a country like South Africa, you'd think on things like this, they would be more aware? In fact, you could say that for so many countries around the world. Um, I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> South Africa is one of the countries where I'm the least surprised that this happened. Uh, because our advertising industry in general is super untransformed. But also, we've got real race issues in South Africa. People are very racist. Um, people are always being caught out. This is not the first corporate that's been called out for having an ad that's, um, you know, distasteful. So it's not really a surprise, I think, to people who live here how this could happen um, in corporate SA. Why is black hair so political? Because it's been used as a means to oppress us for a very long time. Um, I mean, if it's not policing us in terms of even the, the hairstyle that I've chosen today um, is going to be a problem for a lot of people because it's not natural and, you know. So I think people for a long time just always want to police what black women do with our hair, with our bodies, um, and have it as, as an excuse to, to oppress us and to exclude us. Because if you look at um, the code of conduct of a lot of schools and companies, part of the uniform and part of what they speak about is black hair. 
and it needs to look a certain way in order for you to be even allowed in some of those schools. And many of these rules were obviously written before black people were even included in the conversation because, you know, pre-1994, um, there were not a lot of black people in these schools and companies. So it's, it's yeah, it's one of those things where I'm just, um, I've lost my train of thought now. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's tell you what, like... let me ask a question. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Um, okay. <laughs> well, South Africa has a population of which 80% are black people. So what yeah. is normal hair? Well, I mean, to me, normal hair is, is my hair because it's normal to me. So I don't know why they would use a term like that in only referencing blonde, straight hair. Um, but that's part of the, the thing. I don't think people, as much as, I, you know, people are saying that this was negative marketing for a reason, they wanted to trend. I just think some people are so unaware of their prejudices um, that when things come out like this, they're so surprised. To them, the lingo of saying normal versus damaged and dry and using black pictures and photographs um, was completely normal to them. So it's, they just don't see their, their ingrained prejudice. This is something that's taught from a very young age. Um, that's why people always come unsolicited and touch our hair. That's why people always come and have opinions about our hair, because they just think it's this anomaly that's not normal. Um, you know, there was a few years ago, Pretoria Girls High had an incident where girls were punished for having the hair that grows out of their head and told they needed to straighten it and fix it before they could be at the school. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like this has been part of our conversation, South African conversations for a very long time. Same thing happened to me and my friends when we were at school. We always have been policed with our hair. The black boys were told they can't grow their hair, they can't do certain things. Things, but the white boys were able to do much more with their hair and have their hair long and have, you know, those, um, for what they call like ski ramps. So there's just been a lot of times where people use hair as a way to police us, but also as a way to exclude us. Okay, you know what, you've brought up a couple of um, points there. I'm going to try and bring them together. You brought up youth and children. I remember my hair being combed and combed and I'd insist, I want it lying flat, I want it lying flat. And then you, bro you brought up the, the subject of choice. As a woman, you can choose to wear your hair however you want. But here's a point. I know that there are men out there, and I've had a few people on Twitter saying, I don't actually know which one is the right one, the white hair or the black hair. There are men who also say, fix your hair when it's natural. How do we start re-educating people? I don't even think we need to re-educate people. I think people just need to stay out of topics that have nothing to do with them. Um, I, I get told all the time, you know, how can I have issues, speak out about blackness when I have the hair that I have, like I said. So for me, first of all, underneath this, I've got natural hair. It's just a very easy way to go from Coconut Kells's look to, you know, this look. But I also don't owe anyone any explanation. So I don't think it's about educating people on the right things to say about our hair. It's about them just staying out of our business and out of our hair. We can make all the choices. Being a black woman is so amazing because we have so many choices with what to do with our hair. If I want to have dreads, braids, natural, relaxed wig weave, I can do it all. So I think it's just a matter of actually just stay out of our business. Let us do what we want to do um, and then we'll all be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm surprised I didn't use my British accent on the BBC. Oh, but, go on, quickly, know. quickly, quickly, quick, quick. Very next time. Thank you so much, darling. I'm, I'm going to have a spot of tea now. So, okay. yes, thank you. Teetle pit then. <laughs> <laughs> You're watching uh, BBC Focus on Africa. I'm going to let Peter re replace order. We need order to come back, please, Peter. Okay. Many thanks, Luquessa. I hope you like my hair. <laughs> anyway, let's just go to the sports now. And uh, the International Olympic Committee has uh, stressed that next year's Summer Games in Tokyo will go ahead on the 23rd of July, regardless of the coronavirus pandemic. According to the IOC, the Games will be known as the Games that conquered COVID. Travel restrictions and social distancing measures have raised questions about a further postponement or even cancellation. And one opinion poll found only one in four Japanese people now supported holding the Games if coronavirus infections were still widespread next year. Now, in a rather unusual move, the Athletics Integrity Unit will begin conducting mass testing of Kenyan runners this month. It means athletes will have prior notice of the tests and will, they will be carried out in groups. With athletics action slowly resuming across the world amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the AIU is also stepping up measures to increase, increase rather testing of athletes. The global spread of coronavirus slowed down the activities 
of the AIU, that's the body mandated to manage integrity issues in sports, including doping. Now, uh, let's just go now to uh, football because uh, one of Tanzania's biggest teams, uh, the Simba FC, have, nomin have actually named the first ever female CEO. She is Barbara Gonzalez. Uh, Simba FC are representing Tanzania in this year's Champions League, and they've won the country's league 21 times. Barbara Gonzalez spoke to Focus on Africa. I am deeply honored and humble for a young woman from Tanzania to be given such a fantastic opportunity to create a legacy at a club that's been running for over 84 years. I'm really, really honored. Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity not only to inspire young people, but also women across the world that it's possible, it can be done. It's all about your dedication and commitment towards transforming, transformational growth in the clubs that you love. I think my appointment gives hope to young women who are passionate about football but technically shy to enter the industry. It'll also enable those who've been fighting for positions to give a solid example that yes, this is possible. Not only is it possible at Chelsea and other clubs and Everton, but it's also possible in the continent. DRC is a fantastic example at AS Vita and now you have your very own Barbara Gonzalez in Tanzania. Congratulations to her. Finally, the transfer window is hotting up with players moving from one club to another. Some will be out of contract with nowhere to go. And that was the position in which Zimbabwe forward Gabriel Nioni found himself after he was released by the South African top flight side Maritzburg United during the lockdown. But he's now managed to seal a deal with another South African club, Cape Umoya United, just three days after advertising his services on social media. He told us more. After leaving Marisburg United, I thought to myself, I have to take myself out there. You might be a good um, soccer player, you might be a good rugby player, you might be a cook, good cook, you might be a good dancer. But if you don't take yourself out there, no one else will know what you can offer to the world. And as for me, my degree in marketing helped me to come up with an idea of posting my highlights on Twitter so that I market myself, I create awareness of what I can do and what I can offer to the world. And on that tweet only, Cape um, Moya already had interest in me, but it cemented that deal. Mm, I wonder why I didn't think of that. That's all the sports, Lucas, and back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I love your hairstyle. Uh, now, Professor Rina Shah is a household name in Kenya every time matters of infectious diseases arise. She's surrounded by viruses in her day-to-day -day work and, of course, the risk of getting infected by the coronavirus and the many others that she works to. She spoke to the BBC. We've learned a lot about COVID. I think every doctor in the world, we never expected it. It's a disease we didn't know about. Professor Rina Shah is an infectious disease specialist she recounts her experience of working in the COVID-19 unit. So personally, it's, it's been a huge learning curve. As an infectious disease specialist, there are lots of infections that we've managed that uh, can potentially infect us, starting from multidrug resistant TB to H1N1. Of course, there was the Ebola scare, which is very close to us as well. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. The difference with COVID patients is, is the precaution we have to take, right? So with any patient, we can walk into the room the way we are. With, with COVID now, see how I'm dressed. I, we, we've all started wearing scrubs now. Um, uh, we, you have to wear the PPE, you have to gown, wear goggles, masks. It's very different from how we've been managing other patients. The curve started off with anxiety. Is there anything else we can do? Is there anything different? To a sort of a comfort level, you know, to the, yes, we can manage these patients. We know sort of what to do, who are the teams we involve. So it's been a journey of learning, um, lots of um, self-reflection, lots of teaching, lots of how do we move forward. Because a lot of... Professor Rina Shah there. Don't forget that you can get in touch with me and the team on social media. You can find me. I'm at... Lequessa uh, Burak. We'll have plenty more on the programme tomorrow. But from me and the team, bye-bye.